Hi, everybody. I'm Chuck Yarbrough. I teach history at the Mississippi School for Math and Science. And I am so sorry that I could not get the technology on our end to work for our Society of Mississippi Archivist presentation today. Uh, I understand Mona did a fantastic job answering questions. And what I'm going to do is do my part of the presentation solo. No doubt, not as good as it would have been were Mona involved at this point but better than nothing, I suppose. Uh, although that may be presumptuous of me. <laughs> so I'm gonna share the PowerPoint and uh, begin the presentation. Uh, hopefully you enjoy it. Thank you. All right. Okay, so Today, I was asked and Mona was asked to talk about the burial ground as common ground, researching and presenting the 8th of May Emancipation Celebration in Columbus. Uh, I've already introduced myself, Chuck Yarbrough. You already know Mona Vance Ali, the wonderful archivist at our community gym, which is the local history room at the Columbus Lounge Public Library. And I'm gonna get right into it and try not to keep you too long since I've kept you for an hour without actually being there already. Um, oh, and one other thing. I don't typically speak from a script, so this may be offensive to those of you who are archivists. There is no paper copy of what I'm about to do. <laughs> but anyway, why do we do the 8th of May Emancipation Program? The 8th of May Emancipation Celebration, like Tales from the Crypt and like a lot of other research projects that uh, we instituted at our school and that I've done in my classrooms, are really about helping students and community reach peak performance in the cemetery. Now, doesn't that sound awesome? Um, you as archivists are the key feature to this. Uh, what is PEAK? What do I mean by that? PEAK principles are uh, really about the principles that allow students to thrive when they develop what education reformer Ted Dintersmith calls PEAK principles. And it goes like this. In a project like Tales from the Crypt and the 8th of May Emancipation Celebration, students find purpose contributing to our community's understanding of itself. They acquire essential skills, researching and writing and collaborating and speaking and all of those other things that we ask them to do in performance. They also develop agency. They decide how to share what they know, what they've uncovered and, and what that sharing will actually look like, what the presentation will look like. And the students retain the knowledge in a way that allows them to be even more creative and impactful. So where do we do that? Well, the burial ground. I like to say the burial ground is common ground. At the burial ground, every single one of us understands personal loss. We have all experienced it. We all know that we will one day be the one who is lost and every person understands what that feels like because we've lost someone who's dear to us. So that allows us to think about and share a common humanity and ultimately, when we think about loss and humanity, we're thinking about story. And a performance project like the 8th of May Emancipation Celebration is uniquely qualified to kind of get at this idea of story and loss. So loss or humanity story, how do we get at them? Well, that's where you come in. Archival collections offer everyone an avenue to explore all three of those, you know, the raw data, if you will, for the human experience is wrapped up in archives. Is it complete? No, but there's a lot of it there. And we have to figure out ways to get at it, to share with the broader community, to empower our communities. And in my case, my students. So what do we do? Well, at the burial ground, we're going to utilize archival resources. Using those resources to create performances students create spaces and in those spaces they and the audiences are going to begin to create new realizations and levels of understanding about our collective past and of course that informs their ability to shape our future it, it informs our community's ability to do that so okay that's the burial ground is common ground let's talk about the eighth of may emancipation celebration since 2005-2006 uh, this has been a research performance partnership between the Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science and students in my African American history class in our Voices in Harmony Choir and others that are outside of those groups, but the students 
uh, recruit essentially, and the local history room at the Columbus Lounge Public Library. Now, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the project and then kind of get into how it developed and, and we'll talk about the resources in the archives as well as kind of the nuts and bolts of putting it on. Um, first of all, the 8th of May emancipation celebration is, um, it, it consists of groups of two or three students that use primary and secondary sources to research the lives and context of individuals buried in the historic Sandfield Cemetery. Now the Sandfield Cemetery is one of the older African-American cemeteries in the city of Columbus, but it's certainly not the only one. Um, we use the Sandfield Cemetery because one, it's easily accessible, and two, the primary leaders, political and religious and civic leaders in the black community of the late 19th and earliest part of the 20th century are buried in Sandfield. So that's why we choose that one. Um, I organized those groups of students and research subjects around some theme. So you might have two or three students researching two or three research subjects who are connected in some way. So for example, I might have a group of pastors, three or two or three. I might have a group of World War I veterans, might have different members of one family, or maybe cousins that moved to Chicago, some evidence of the Great Migration, any number of possible combinations, or maybe people went to the same school, Union Academy. The students conduct the research, they use resources in the library as well as online, and they create research folders. Those research folders, that raw material, the data that's in your archives, they then use to create original scripts that explore the historical topics the students are discovering through their research. So, for example, a couple of years ago, we had a group of students researching World War I veterans, African-American local World War I veterans who went to Europe. And, uh, and that was a pretty engaging and fascinating, in fact, performance. So that would be one example of the script they put together. Now, each group of researchers writing a script with input from me, by the way, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I kind of help them craft them to make them as powerful as they, they can. But they then select and recruit a student performer that may be one member of the group or it may be somebody they just know is a good performer. And that student will be charged with developing the character further with the help of that group of students and uh, to share the findings and understanding with the public audience. And that project culminates with a public performance that partners the students in the class, the students they've recruited as speaking performers, and members of our Voices in Harmony Choir, which is a student-directed, student-led choir, gospel choir. Um, and you'll see that in just a couple of minutes. That performance takes place in Sandfield Cemetery and now has grown to annually include a crowd of two to 300 and typically gets a lot of nice local press coverage and a little bit of national coverage as well. So let's talk about that place. Uh, we're not in the archives yet, I realize that. Okay, the place, Sandfield Cemetery is the place. Established in the 1840s, it is, as I've already said, one of the historical African-American burial grounds and it's identified as such in early 20th century city directories and newspapers, that kind of thing. So that's our location. Um, what does it look like? Well, this is a photograph. Uh, I'm, I get asked often to lead tours to Sandfield Cemetery, local African-American historical tours. This is a photograph taken during one of those tours. Looks like it was a chilly day, if I remember correctly. And what you'll notice there is that there aren't a whole lot of tombstones. This cemetery, we do believe, is full, at least the western half of it, which is the historic part where we do our performance, but the lack of tombstones is suggestive of the low socioeconomic um, status of African Americans who would have been buried there. Um, that makes the tombstones that are there that much more noteworthy in, in one sense and definitely more likely to have something in an archive somewhere connected to their story. The date. Now we picked the 8th of May because according to the diarist Cyrus Green, Union troops arrived in Columbus on the 8th of May, 1865. Now he says that on the 8th of May, 1866, when in his diary he records that today was a day long to be remembered by members of the African race here, is what his words are. And um, what he's saying is, that, or he says in that passage, that a year ago on the 8th of May, 1865, Union troops first arrived in this place. Now, 
the importance of that date is attached obviously to emancipation. While the Emancipation Proclamation, of course, had been signed well before this, the reality was that emancipation didn't even arrive as a possibility until federal troops arrived in any place. So when federal troops arrive here, that's cause for immense celebration. And indeed, the 8th of May would be celebrated as an Emancipation Day, a celebration, Independence Day, for well over a century. Uh, Columbus newspapers in the early 20th century offer brief accounts of 8th of May celebrations and parades. There are accounts in the Macon paper down in Noxubee County and in the Aberdeen paper in Monroe County to the north of us of people traveling on the train to Columbus to celebrate the 8th of May. And both Aberdeen and, and Macon had celebrations as well at some point in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, what did those celebrations look like? Well, there were games, speakers, food, you know, music. You know, it, it was a party, if you will. So those are the places, and then we need to have the resources. And this is where the archives comes in. Now, you guys had a chance to ask questions of Mona. Uh, the Columbus Lounge Public Library Local History Room is an absolute one essential aspect of the research performance projects we do. And it's a wonderful institution for taking an archives and bringing it to life by sharing it with the community. And I'm very happy and proud that my students help in that role. But you know, without us, I'm pretty certain Mona would figure out a way to do it and maybe do it even better, <laughs> right? So a shout out to them. The Billups Garth Archives and Library Digital Resources like Ancestry.com, the library edition, are both places our students have gleaned information and I have gleaned information from records there. Um, additional, well, here's an example. This is uh, actually from the Ancestry.com um, library edition and news, access to newspapers. This is from 1906, the 8th of May. Thursday was the 8th of May and the day was as usual celebrated by the colored people of Columbus. And it goes on to talk about the pastor of the uh, Methodist church. Uh, Reverend W.H. Edmonds is a key speaker. There are baseball games, shooting matches, celebration. Uh, this is an example of 1913. Down at the bottom left, of this particular newspaper excerpt is the Emancipation Day, the 8th of May, Emancipation Day. And then up at the top right is the um, St. Paul's Episcopal Church celebration of the 8th of May. They held a luncheon on the 8th of May, which was a fundraiser for the ladies of the church because many of the white families had domestic servants who were off on the 8th of May celebrating independence and freedom. So, um, another really important resource that Mona, and I know a lot of you guys have been involved with in the Society of Mississippi Archi Archivists, is making the Mississippi Digital Library come to life with resources. The Mississippi Digital Library um, materials for Columbus, Mona and her staff have been working diligently to digitize, scan, and then put in a form that's usable. And indeed, we have been using those resources uh, I, I, they've been irreplaceable this year in the pandemic. So what can you find on there? One is you can find the, the diary of Cyrus Green, the Quaker from Indiana who came here to teach at that Freedmen's Bureau school that I mentioned previously. We start our performances each year with a student who portrays Cyrus Green and that student actually reads from segments of his diary. And uh, in fact, I'm going to stop sharing this for just a moment and share something else, which is going to be a YouTube segment. Uh, by the way, I think this is something we can do now on, um, we can do now in this YouTube presentation that might not have worked on WebEx. This is the very beginning of the 8th of May celebration in 2019. Not a professional recording by any stretch of the imagination, but I think you'll enjoy it. So we're gonna watch just a few seconds, get a sense of how it begins. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Cyrus Green, and I'm a Quaker from Indiana who came down to Columbus, Mississippi early in 1866 to teach with the Freedmen's Bureau. I kept a diary, and as we begin our celebration today, I would like to share with you all some of what impressed me about the freedmen and freedwomen I had met while I was here. I did not fully realize the violence I would come to witness, nor the courage 
I would see in response. On February 12th, 1866, I wrote of threatened horrors. Night school tonight. We heard a hint this evening that there was talk among the Southern chivalry and Yankee haters of setting fire to the Wayside Hospital, and thus we put an end to our work there. I hope there is no danger, yet it, it may be so. Okay, so that is um, Cyrus Green's diary in the hands of a capable performer, uh, Kaylin McNeese, who graduated here in 2019. Now, first of all, before you um, archivists get upset, that was not the original document in his hands in that book, nor was that book very old. It just looked a little bit old, okay. But that's an example of the type of resource that is now available in the digital library, thanks to Mona's staff, and is now available to our students. Now we've been using the paper copy and that's what we have here um, for years now. But in any case, it's a, that's one of the things we find and get from the, the uh, resources in the library. The City of Columbus Minute Books are part of our research. Again, in the archives, most recently, these have been made available through the Mississippi Digital Library as well. And this is actually an excerpt from the City Minutes where the leader of the school that Cyrus Green worked in, which is a Freedmen's Bureau school that became ultimately the public school Union Academy, but is called Union Academy well before it becomes a public school. So I would argue that Union Academy in Columbus is certainly among the first schools for African Americans in the state of Mississippi. In any case, on April 19th, 1866, Dr. Wilson, the director of that school and his staff received a threatening letter. They gave that letter to the city council and the city council transcribed the letter in the city council minutes and then passed a resolution, you know, um, decrying that threat, uh, denouncing that and pledging they would offer support of the city of Columbus to the efforts of the school. This is the letter, which again, we use in the performance and students uncover in their research and, and use in the ways they want to. It says Columbus, Mississippi, April 19th, 1866. Dr. Wilson, with the undersigned, have determined that you shall not stay in this country and teach a Negro school. And if you do not leave, we will hang you and your whole crowd. Do as you please, leave or not. That is one thing we are determined on, that you shall not stay if we can procure a rope that will hold you. Leave immediately, your many enemies. That's the kind of record that's available in the archives to tell completely the story of Columbus. And we're accessing it with my students. Now, that set of resources in the archives connects us to what's in the actual cemetery. And I wanna talk a little bit about, you already, okay, you know, we got two or three students researching using the resources in the archives and they are researching a small group of people may be connected by some theme like World War I participation or something like that, or family. And then I want to talk about some of the things they've uncovered over the years. Again, in conjunction with me, to be quite frank, some of the things I uncover and share with the students, and then they put them in performance. Uh, for example, the story of Jack and Gilly Rabb and their family. Jack Rabb was a free man of color, the family believed, and uh, who married Gilly Rabb sometime after the Civil War, and they had several children, and one of them, well, they went on to be a pretty prominent family, but there was no verification of Jack Rabb's free status, even though the family had said he was free before the Civil War ended, until a student actually in Tales from the Crypt uncovered a court case in the Lowndes County records, and that court case was a, a lawsuit by a guy named Charles Hereford, against Alan Rabb, the oldest son of Jack Rabb. Charles Hereford claimed to be an illegitimate child of Jack Rabb by an enslaved woman born in 19, excuse me, born in 1862. Hereford sued for part of the inheritance that Jack Rabb and Gilly Rabb left to their children. The courts found against him. The courts found that Charles Hereford was the illegitimate child of Jack Rabb. However, because he was born of a slave woman and enslaved status was matrilineal, 
Charles Hereford at birth had no right to inheritance, even though this lawsuit was after Jack Rabb's death in 1882. Who was the person being sued? This guy. This is Alan Rabb. It was Jack Rabb's oldest son. Alan Rabb established a meat market in downtown Columbus on what was then North Market Street, next door, by the way, to where the Friendly City Bookstore just opened. And then at some point in the 19 teens, he moved his location over to the south side, just off the campus of the Industrial Institute and College, now MUW. It was on the corner of Fifth Avenue South and to 10th Street, uh, no, ninth, excuse me, 9th Street. Um, this is that location. This is Rab's Meat Market on the left, his house actually over here on the right, you can see a pretty substantial building. And, uh, and this was the, you know, his part of the world. Uh, Alan Rab, as I said, was very successful. Members of his family eventually took part in the great migration and they moved to Chicago along with other Columbus families. And then eventually some of his children ended up in Louisville, Kentucky and in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and other places out West and up North. And in fact, right now his great grandson, Christopher Rabb is a state assemblyman from Philadelphia in the Pennsylvania State Assembly. Another person we've learned a lot about over the years is State Senator Robert Gleed. Now this is admittedly a pretty terrible uh, photocopy of the composite for the state legislature, but you get a sense of what he looked like. They, we really don't have much on him. Um, this is his daughter's grave site, okay? State Senator Robert Gleed was enslaved. We believe he was an escaped um, slave who was captured here in Columbus during the Civil War. He refused to uh, announce who the person who was a slaveholder was, and therefore, according to state law, was sold back into slavery to a guy named Miller. After the war, he gained his freedom, and he became a prominent business and then political leader. He was appointed to the Columbus Board of Aldermen, city council, by the military governor, and then he was elected to the Mississippi State Senate. And it, to this day, it remains the only African-American man to represent all of Lowndes County in the Mississippi State Senate. He would remain in the Senate until he ran for sheriff of Lowndes County in 1875. And in 1875, the documents the, in city minutes record that he was leading a parade through downtown Columbus on the eve of the 1875 election. We would probably call that a get out the vote rally today and they were attacked by a mob, a white mob. Four people were shot and killed, three were wounded. He testified about those events before Congress, not once, but twice, but there really wasn't protection for him. Eventually he ended up in Galveston, Texas, and, uh, and that's where he died and his body was brought back to Columbus for internment in 1916. And again, getting in the archives, we even have the response to his death in the local paper. One person writes, that he was respected and a capable uh, businessman and political leader. Another writes that he was the last survivor that held office that are now in 1916 held by honorable whites. So you get this white supremacy story very clearly conveyed in, in the archives. Uh, Anna Louise Glade was a teacher. She taught at Union Academy here in Columbus and then moved to Texas and lived there until she died in 1938. Gleed had a store downtown and it was cat a corner to the Columbus, um, well, to the Lowndes County Courthouse, which this is a Historic American Building Survey photograph from the 1930s at the Lowndes County Courthouse. And the uh, Confederate monument over here on the left, interestingly, would have been staring right across the corner at Gleed's store location which of course was gone by the time this monument was put up. Another person is uh, William Isaac Mitchell. Uh, Professor William Isaac Mitchell was born into slavery in about 1855, and he uh, became one of the first students at Alcorn A&M. He became the first African-American principal of the Union Academy, and he was so loved and respected as an educator after his death in 1916, a new school was open for African-Americans called Mitchell Elementary, Mitchell Memorial Elementary School on the south side of Columbus. He also was active in Missionary Union Baptist Church 
He also was somebody who did training institutes and, and surrounding communities for African-American teachers. And he also was a business leader. He was the president of the Penny Savings Bank here in Columbus. All information that students get at through our partnership with the archives, either in documents or, well, either in person documents or online. This is a photograph of uh, William Isaac Mitchell and the board of directors of the uh, Penny Savings Bank. Uh, a couple of interesting figures here. On the far left over here to William Isaac Mitchell's right is J.M. Schumpert. And Reverend Schumpert was actually a delegate to the National Republican Convention in 1912. And then uh, down here seated on the far left is the Dr. Theodric V. James, the first African-American doctor in Columbus. This is a photograph, uh, well, a photocopy of a photograph of Union Academy from sometime in the mid 20th century before it was torn down. Another couple of people we find out information about, Benjamin Fernandez on the left and his wife, Emma Fernandez. Benjamin Fernandez was the first African-American member of the Columbus School Board, if you will. It was the Franklin Academy School Board of Trustees. And then this is the gravesite of Richard Denthorff Little John. Little John is somebody else we've uncovered a good bit of information about over the years, piece by piece. He was a Grand Mason and he was, uh, I don't remember where he was born, but he was a graduate of Oberlin College. And he came to Columbus sometime in the late 19th century. And by the time of his death in 1903, owned several bits of property downtown. Uh, when he died, he was a prominent guy. When, when I first went out in the cemetery in the late 1990s to start to figure out if we could do a cemetery project in Sandfield, I was walking through the cemetery with a, you know, a legal pad and just jotting down names on tombstones. Well, I came about halfway through the cemetery. There's a path through the cemetery and it goes from a bunch of houses to a little quick stop. And it's often that path is frequented by people that are walking from the neighborhood to the quick stop and then walking by with a frosty cold beverage. Well, I, one guy was walking back with a, a very large beer, okay? And, uh, and he asked me what I was doing. And I explained to him, well, you know, I'm a history teacher and I'm doing this project, trying to figure out if we can research people buried out here. And I asked him, do you know anybody who's buried out here or anything about them? And his answer was, well, not really, but, but that guy over there, that guy was heavy. And he was pointing to Richard Denther for Little John's grave. Well, it's hard to tell from this photograph, but this plinth, the bottom part of the uh, tombstone is about six or seven feet high. And then lying down on the ground behind it is an obelisk that was knocked down in the early 1990s when a tornado came through this uh, neighborhood. And it's another six feet or so. And then the urn standing over there in the left-hand side of the image, that would have gone on top of the um, obelisk. So you put those back together and you've got a monument that's 12, maybe 15 feet tall. So Richard Denther for Little John was indeed heavy. And that's the kind of story we're trying to get at, learn more about so that we can share more about this Columbus uh, history, the African-American story. Another person we get to talk about some who is tangentially connected to the leaders there is Dr. Emma J. Stringer. Now, Dr. Stringer is not buried in the Sandfield Cemetery, but students have found connections to him there, and that allows us to tell his story. He was a, a, a dentist. And he was from, uh, originally from Mountain Bayou, he was educated at Meharry Medical College in Nashville. And he located here sometime in the late 1940s. He became the leader of the local NAACP, eventually became the president of the Mississippi NAACP. And he led the voter registration drive and the first petitions to uh, integrate the local schools after Brown versus the Board of Education. The Ku Klux Klan actually put him on a hit list in 1956 and uh, by the end of the year, everybody on that hit list, I think there were six people on it, um, they were all out of the Mississippi, out of the state of Mississippi, and, except for Emmett Stringer. His wife was a teacher. She was fired because of his activism. Eventually she worked for the um, Air Force Base, but she was fired from a Columbus City Schools job. And Dr. Stringer's story brings us from late 19th into the 20th century and lastly, there's a connection to the national story because Dr. Stringer, as state president of the NAACP, we know from Merle Evers Williams, was the person who asked Medgar Evers to become the first field secretary of the NAACP in Mississippi. 
And Merle Evers William recalled that that happened at Dr. Stringer's house here in Columbus. So let's talk about performance. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a minute so I can pause my recording and set something else up that I think you'll find to be a treat. Okay, in just a minute, I'm going to show you a couple of short clips of performances. We're gonna talk about the performance and, uh, and I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint for just a moment and then get back to you. Okay, so the last part, so what we do is we have research, we have writing, and then we develop a public performance, as I've said, for two, 300 people. And this has made a big impact in our community. That started with the, the young lady in the gingham dress here in the middle of this image. I, I think it was on February 26th of 2006, uh, Renita Holmes from Louisville, Mississippi, came to me and asked, she was the president of the Voices in the Harmony Choir, Mr. Yarbrough, would you help us put together our Black History Month program? I'd done a lot of local history research. I know a lot about history. And uh, so I was a good person to ask that question. And I said, absolutely, Renita, but there's a problem. It's February 26th, <laughs> not, not February 1st, and Black History Month will be over in 48 hours. So we talked some and I explained to her, there's another possibility to do a program like what you're talking about. And that is the um, 8th of May. And I explained the program to her. We met the next week and put together the initial performance. And the way we designed it was with singing followed by some dramatic monologue by more singing, potentially by individual students sharing original spoken word poetry or maybe somebody else's spoken word poetry, and then finishing with the crowd and performers singing in unison, lift every voice and sing. And I have to tell you, it's one of the most moving moments of my uh, year, every year. This was the original performance group. You can see it's all of, we had three spoken performers and we had maybe 10 other singers and that was it. It looked like this, okay, this is 2006 beneath the shade of that tree, because we wanted shade, we needed shade. It's May in Mississippi, it's already getting warm. And you can see I hauled out a couple of dozen chairs and we didn't have enough for everybody. So a couple of people shared, <laughs> WCBI covered it. We thought it was a big success and thought, well, this is a really neat community thing. Um, by 2018, it's become a pretty big deal. And I'm gonna stop sharing this so I can now share a sample of the kind of music you would hear at one of our performances. This is from 2019, and it's a clip from a YouTube uh, performance. And we'll just listen to the beginning of what I think you'll agree is an amazing performance. I just realized I made a mistake in the share. Let me try this again. This will work. Don't stop there because you're not as good as that. That's what you guys are thinking. And I agree. But 
the, I just want to give you the taste of that performance. Um, so what does it look like in the long run? Okay, well, what we have, uh, excuse me, I made a mistake on my end. So let me get back to where I need to be. Okay, so this is in 2018, and you can see the, first of all, beautiful photograph, students singing. Uh, we're going to be delivering performances in between songs. This is a young man named Ezra McWilliams, who's from the Delta, and he's actually performing as Alan Rabb, the man whose photograph you saw in front of his meat market earlier. Tyza Johnson and Jokiah Bryant are sharing the story of pastor's wives talking about the role of religion in the community in 2018. Samantha Anderson is singing a solo performance, not unlike Swing Low Sweet Chariot that you just saw. And, and this is the kind of advertising that we do, it, it's simply posters. Eighth of May Emancipation Celebration, Historic Sandfield Cemetery. We have been blessed to have partnerships with the city of Columbus and of course the Columbus Lounge Public Library, but the history department at the Mississippi State University has been supportive and I appreciate that. Visit Columbus and the Cultural Heritage Foundation and we have other co-sponsors and helpers that help make this a reality. Now, I, I will point that out that that's really great for you thinking about your archives coming to life. There are potential partnerships here that can make any archive more accessible to the public. And a performance program like this might just be the thing for you. This is the crowd more recently, okay, 2019. Um, this particular year, you see video crews in the background, uh, big audience. We were really excited about what went down that year. And then this is a young man portraying State Senator Robert Gleed. I'm gonna stop sharing and pause for a moment so I can set up a video that you can watch him. So the next thing we'll see, we're gonna watch a brief clip from Darian Bowles' performance of State Senator Robert Gleed. I hope you'll enjoy. Things weren't always easy for my family, my success, it brought tension and violence upon my household. Most local whites couldn't conceive of free men as their equals. And when I ran for sheriff of Lowndes County in 1875, jealous white men invaded my home, shot into my furniture, and shredded Susan's clothes. Unfortunately, my family was able to flee to the safety of the woods. And on that same night, the night of November 2nd, 1875, I was leading the voter parade throughout the Lowndes. <coughs> Today you might call it a get out the vote rally. Now as we move through downtown, a mob led by Jacob Hunter Sharp attacked us. They shot into our group, killing four innocent black men and wounded three others. And I owe my life to a friend that hid me in his well that night. The next day, hardly any of my people voted for fear of their lives. The dream of freed men and freed women being fully accepted as citizens seemed dead after that night. And I testified to those events before Congress, but there was no federal help that would come to restore the protections of the Constitution upon me and my people. Neither President Grant nor Congress were willing to protect black citizens from violence and terror. Now, that performance is powerful and reveals the type of story we can share in a cemetery. I like to say that people come into the cemetery with an open heart because of that burial ground being common ground. And they're open to hearing a truth that has only been partially told in most people's understanding of history. And again, this is a way that you guys know the truths in your archives, this is a way to make them accessible to a broader public. Um, now I'm gonna to return to my PowerPoint. So this was Darian who you just saw performing. Um, this is my final piece is about community impact. Um, this is a photograph from 2018 or 2019. And again, a different angle on the crowd. 
by the way, that's the same tree we performed under the very first year. Now we have a stage and it's grown a good bit. Um, we've gotten a lot of attention in the national um, for the 8th of May emancipation celebration, which is another way to bring value to your community from your archives. The Atlantic covered what we do in May 8, 2014. Uh, we've been in US News and World Report. And in fact, this particular piece was a commercial dispatch story that was picked up by the AP and went all over the planet. I know I saw it in the Houston Chronicle and it also was in the Philadelphia Inquirer because I just happened to run into that a couple of days ago when I was looking for something else. And we also have been covered in uh, it pretty extensively in Deb and Jim Fallow's that New York Times bestselling book, Our Towns, Thousand Mile Journey into the Heart of America. Check the book out, it's really great. And we also have had community impact in the actual physical memorialization of our story. When I got to Columbus in the mid 1990s, I was interested in exploring the African-American experience historically. Now, you guys know this, Columbus, Mississippi. These are places in which the joke is that, you know, history is one of the growth industries. <laughs> I looked around Columbus for evidence of the black experience. And this is the only state historic marker I could find with any mention of the African-American community. And it's a CSA arsenal historic marker and the last line is, oh yeah, this building all was, also was the first free public school in Columbus for African-Americans. The black community is an afterthought. When this was put up in the 1950s, the reason this is put up is essentially to uh, reaffirm that lost cause version of history that we still struggle with because it was an incomplete history. And I'm reminded, in fact, I shared it with a radio audience just a couple of weeks ago. Remember that an incomplete history is a biased history. So our job as archivists, as historians, as teachers is to try to empower our communities for a more complete understanding of our story. This is the most recent state historic marker in Columbus. I'm very proud to say it came as a result of the 8th of May emancipation celebration. This uh, marker was advocated for one of the local garden clubs led by a wonderful retired MEW professor, Martha Jo Mims. And this is the landscaping the garden club did around this brand new state historic marker that they partnered with the city and of course archives and history to get in the ground. This was the dedication of that marker just before our 8th of May emancipation celebration in 2019. So the community is gaining a greater appreciation of our complete story, including all of the stories researched and told in the 8th of May Emancipation Celebration. And that state historic marker is a very tangible sign of that. It's also getting us now international recognition. The 8th of May Emancipation Program will be in an HBO documentary made on that best-selling book, Our Towns, this April 13th, um, 2021. Uh, by the way, if you don't subscribe to HBO, the time to start your seven-day free trial is maybe April 12th, <laughs> okay? But in any case, um, Our Towns will be on HBO. They were here in 2019. They recorded, they filmed, the uh, students in the archives, working with me and with Mona in performance, of course, in the cemetery. Uh, we even went out and got some footage like this shot the day before, just so they would have something to kind of soundtrack it a little bit. Really great stuff. So we're bringing national and maybe international attention to Columbus through an archival collaboration with a school. I think that's pretty cool. Okay. Um, and that's the photograph of the cover of the book as well. So I started this off talking about peak principles and how the 8th of May Emancipation Celebration as a partnership between the Columbus Lowndes County Library, local history room and Phillips Garth Archives and the school, MSMS and my African-American history students um, allows us as a community, I, I said students, but it really allows us as a community to reach our peak performance, purpose. Community members through projects like this with your archives can tackle challenges that are important and then make contributions to the community. Essentials, community members can acquire skill sets and mindsets that are needed in an increasingly innovative world. We're challenged to change, this helps. Agency, 
we gain ownership. Community members who own are learning, we're self-directed, we're motivated, we make a difference in the community. And this can do that. And then knowledge. You know, what we learn together, we retain together. And then we can create together. We can make together. We can teach together. We can create a greater future for our communities. So this is where I would have paused and allowed you to ask questions, were it not for the technological snafu that went down. Uh, by the way, this is an old postcard of Columbus and I superimposed in the middle a kind of posted stamp size photograph of one of the 8th of May emancipation parades from around the turn of last century. I will invite you to follow on Twitter or Instagram uh, MSMS, which is MSMS Blue Waves, at MSMS Blue Waves. I'm C. Yarg one and Lowndes Library is the other. Thank you for having me. And I do apologize so much for the failure of the technology to allow me to be able to answer questions. Do not hesitate to reach out to me if I can help in any way with your archives of public program. Thanks so much. And once again, thank you to Mona Vance Ali and the staff at the Columbus Lounge uh, Library Local History Room. We couldn't do it without them. And also thank you to the Society of Mississippi Archivists and Carrie Maslow for inviting us to be part of y'all's uh, program today. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye.